This week, Reverend Wendy continues her series, From Struggle to Well-Being, and it takes a closer look at ways to start moving from the reactive mind into the listening and accepting heart. So, the title of my talk this morning is Welcome, with an exclamation point. Welcome. Say that with me. Welcome. Welcome. We have been exploring together Mary O'Malley's book, What's in the Way is the Way. This morning, before I get into the message, I want to read one of the quotes that I shared at first service because it builds on or is a part of this idea of welcome and where I want to go with it. This is a Rumi quote. How many Rumi fans? I like Rumi a lot. This is a Rumi quote. Most people are familiar with the last line of this Rumi quote, but not the context of it. And you really need the, con- I think you need the context of it. This being human is a guest house. Every morning is a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness, comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Treat each guest honorably. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. We like the last part. Each has been sent as a guide from beyond. But the context that Rumi is painting is is a very broad and somewhat challenging context when we think about it. What he's talking about are all the different emotions that we experience from time to time largely as a result of things that we are thinking and things we are experiencing and dealing with in our lives. And certainly there are certain emotions and feelings that we experience that are wonderful. And we'd like to stay in that place always. And it's easy to put out the welcome mat for those experiences. But Rumi is painting a much broader and truly a much more accurate picture of what it is to live a, an aware human life. That we experience a range of inner qualities, inner emotions. And he is saying, welcome them all. Now why would he say that? And why would Mary O'Malley and the book that we are working with suggests essentially the same thing. That we are to welcome, that we are to be open to whatever is going on inside of us. To be open to whatever is going on inside of us. Why would they say that? I think that they would say that because to be open to whatever is going on inside of us helps us have a much more effective way of moving through and beyond those things that do happen inside of us that are unpleasant. The whole journey we've been taking with Mary O'Malley in this book is a journey from struggle to a more joy-filled way of being in the world. That's not to suggest that everything that we experience in the world feels joyful in and of itself. But the recurrent theme is that there is a way to experience the full gamut of our lives without the usual struggle that most of us endure. We are attempting to learn how to move from the reactive mind into the listening and accepting heart. To move from the reactive mind to the listening and accepting heart. Now here's a warning. As we do this deep inner work of looking within and making welcome, accepting what is ever there for now so that we can move beyond it, as we begin to look more earnestly and deeply within, we're going to start to notice with greater frequency 
parts of ourselves that we don't like. The more we begin to look, the more we're gonna notice some things that we've been kind of pushing aside because we just don't want to look at them. And we certainly don't want anybody else to see them. Are you with me? Okay. So those things exist. It is not until and unless we begin to shine a different kind of light on them that they begin to lose, loosen their tight grasp on us. And so we're gonna be exploring some approaches to how we can help to have those qualities, those experiences loosen their tight grip on us. O'Malley suggests that to do this work well, we need to understand something about ourselves, that there are three layers to us. And there are, in many teachings and modalities, this general concept um, is expressed with different words, that we are not just this physical being, that there are several layers to us. I'm gonna use Mary's words here, and then I'll interject some of the way that we look at it in unity. She would say that the top layer of us is our mind, is our mind. She says a challenge though is that rather than using this top layer, our mind, to be curious, most of us have turned it into a repetitive storyteller that is narrating our world and usually in a very limited and very critical and negative sort of way and that this top layer of our mind is really focused on what it likes as well as what it dislikes and works really hard to grasp at and maintain what it likes and to push away what it doesn't like, to resist what it doesn't like. And when it doesn't get what it likes, it will often numb itself in a variety of ways, exercising a variety of compulsions. She says the second layer is the so-called unacceptable or unmet parts of us. Both of those are important keys here. Either the unacceptable parts of us, the part that we don't even wanna look at and we sure hope it doesn't ever come out for anybody else to see, the unaccepted parts or the unmet parts, we won't even look at all. In certain forms of psychology, it's referred to as our shadow as our shadow. Any of you do shadow work? Have done some shadow work? Powerful, powerful work to do. Powerful not only to look at as an individual, but powerful to look at in group dynamics. I mean, imagine if our whole country, I won't go too far with this, but imagine if our whole country were to do some shadow work. Maybe we need to do some shadow work to, to get beyond where we are now, but that's a whole other talk and probably not for Sunday morning. The bottom layer, O'Malley says, is who we really are. Who we really are, which is not this physical body, it's not our mind, it's not what's happened to us, it is our essential self. It is the consciousness. It is the God within, the divine within. It is what we touch in ourselves and recognize in the other when we greet each other with the namaste greeting. There is that in me that is holy and divine. I didn't put it there, and I can't get rid of it. Thank God I can't. There is that in you that is holy and divine. You didn't put it there. You can't get rid of it. You can hide it, but you can't get rid of it. It is what you are. We are always living from at least one of those levels of our lives, and some of, or layers of our lives, and some of us don't recognize yet that there is this deeper layer. Our spiritual awakening is about understanding what that deeper layer is, and then attempting to remove any of the blocks to the full free expression of that layer, wherever we are, no matter where we are, who we're with, or what's going on. So we need to understand those various layers of our being. And then O'Malley suggests that there are four tools that we can use to help ourselves awaken. When I think of what we exist 
the reason that we exist as a community. We exist as a community to help people awaken spiritually and to grow, to grow as a result of that awakening. We awaken as soon as we recognize that we are not just this physical form, that there is that God presence, that God energy within us that's with equally within everyone else. And then our growth comes as we begin to practice the things that help us stay consistently in that awareness and that awakeness. And part of that is welcoming all of the experiences internally and externally that we find ourselves in. So she says there are four tools of awakening. The first tool is curiosity, and we've talked quite a bit about that already, but to refresh your, your memory on the tool of curiosity, it is the ability to turn toward your experience with fascination rather than either getting lost in the experience or resisting and ignoring the experience. It's to turn toward the experience, to turn toward that part of you that, that's causing disruption within you and all around you. It's to turn toward that with fascination. Oh, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Rather than getting consumed by it, getting lost in it, getting frightened by it, or resisting it completely. What is a fundamental teaching we have in metaphysics? What we resist persists. And I would say even more than persists, it expands and persists. So why in the world would we insist on continuing to resist, right? Because we don't know any better. And because once we know any better, maybe we don't have enough loving people around us to remind us that there's a different way to be. So she says that one of the tools of awakening is curiosity. A second tool of awakening is partnering with your wisdom self. Say that with me. Partnering with your wisdom self. I wish that every young person born from this moment forward was born and given the awareness by the adults around them that they have within them a wisdom self, that they have within them the access to intuition and insight and wisdom that does not come from book learning and does not come from outside of them, but comes from the essence of what they are as an expression of the divine. When we partner with this wisdom self, what we are attempting to do in our lives is we are attempting to connect with that higher knowledge, that higher wisdom, by asking the kinds of questions that open the doorway to make welcome that level of answer. Too often, out of our impatience, when we ask deeper life-probing questions, we allow the surface level of the mind to give us the answer. And one of the very fundamental challenges with that is the surface level of the mind typically deals with duality. The surface level of the mind deals with the duality. The surface level of the mind also is usually very influenced by the storyteller, which is pulling up all the wounded stories of our past. But we are not that. Remember, we are not the struggle. We are not the pain. We are the space in which that is happening. And the space in which that is happening, that which is around that, we might look at as that wisdom self. And so rather than rushing the process when we are trying to understand ourselves better or to, to ask and, and be guided around more important questions, is to not take the first top answer response, but to create an openness where a higher answer is made welcome to come forth. Does that make sense? I love the questions that she suggests can help us to evoke this higher level response. I smiled when I got to that part of her writing because the only book that I've written to date is entitled Ask Yourself This. And it is a book about questions. And it's a book about questions because 
I have learned in my own life experience how incredibly valuable it is to ask the right kinds of questions at the right time. And just as important as asking the right kind of questions at the right time, I have learned how essential it is to let the answer come and not try to force it. Man, that's so much easier to say than do. How many of you remember experiences we've had together as a community when we do those white stone ceremonies? And I always say to you, don't try to think what the answer is. Instead of trying to think the answer to the question, what is your guiding word or practice for the new year? Hold it as a question and let God or spirit or your wisdom self give you the answer. And how many times some of you have told me, but I was so hoping it was gonna be this, and it's not. Or how come I always get the same one? <laughs> That's even more revealing, and really in a way more of a gift. So the question she suggests, when we're noticing those aspects of ourselves that keep showing up, those feelings inside, the resistance, the upset, whatever the pattern may be, we ask questions like these and we don't rush to fill them with an answer. Instead, we make welcome the coming of the answer. Here are the questions she suggests. What is asking to be met here? What is asking to be met here? What is asking to be seen? What is asking to be seen? And what am I ready to see? Oh my goodness, those two, those last two to me are really potent questions. What is asking to be seen here? The surface level mind is often very quick to tell you what's ready to be seen based on appearances and story. Based on appearances, what did Jesus say about appearances? Don't let them be what drives your judgment. Don't judge based on appearances. What is asking to be seen here pierces that surface level tendency and says, don't get tripped up here by the appearance. There is likely something beneath the appearance that is wanting to be seen by you, by your heart, by your soul. And what am I ready to see? Whoa, whoa. As soon as we look more deeply and as soon as we ask a question like, what am I ready to see? we may begin to uncover much more important and deeper truths about ourselves, our soul's journey, what we have come here to heal from, what we have come here to be, what we have come here, how we have come here to serve and to make a difference. The third tool of awakening that she writes about or suggests is our aware heart. She says that we, and I agree with her, we tend to be so caught up in the mind that we so undervalue the wisdom of the heart. And that in the wisdom of the heart, we are to bring the, atten the kind of attention that accepts and heals. Let me say that again. The kind of attention that accepts and then heals. She says, it is your heart that knows how to embrace rather than resist. Your mind can't do this work because it is dualistic in nature. Here's something that she says about what happens when we open ourselves to being led and guided by the aware heart. Why is it so powerful to be curious and accepting about what you are experiencing rather than trying to change it in any way? What's our usual reaction when we're experiencing something externally or internally that we don't like? Would you not agree that for most of us our usual reaction is either to resist it to fight it, to sweep it under the carpet, to try to control it, to ignore it, to close our eyes to it, to try whatever we can to make it do what? Go away, go away right, to go away. I'm listening right now to A Higher Loyalty by James Comey, and I was stunned by a line in, in, in the book. And I heard it just yesterday as I was walking. I stopped my walk and jotted it down because it fits this part of the message. 
He said, buried pain never gets better with age. This was from the former FBI director. That's what made it even more shocking to me. I mean, it's so right. It's so new thought. It's so unity. Buried pain never gets better with age. So back to O'Malley, why is it so power to, powerful to be curious and accepting about what you are experiencing rather than trying to change it in any way? Attention that is accepting heals. Think about that for a moment. Attention that is accepting heals. Say it softly with me. Attention that is accepting heals. One of the most powerful paradoxes you will come across on your healing journey is that true transformation can only happen in an atmosphere of acceptance and listening. When you give accepting attention to whatever you are experiencing, the energy that was bound up in it begins to expand, move, and eventually let go. Many years ago when I did a lot of pastoral counseling and when I helped people learn to meditate better and others learn how to, to um, minimize or overcome migraine headaches, I used um, equipment called biofeedback equipment. It's very common now. A lot of our watches and stuff give us a certain amount of biofeedback. But I worked with all four modalities from galvanic skin response and EEGs and all sorts of different modalities. And when I would work with patients or people who were suffering from severe migraine headaches and were looking for maybe an inner way to help moderate some of that pain, one of the things that was part of my coaching was touch the pain. Don't pull away from it. Touch it and be with it so that you're resistant. When we resist it, whether we're talking about a physical pain or anything else, it lives in a stronger, more powerful way. It's almost as if it's pulling, or it's almost like it's hooking into us with a firm grasp. So, but if you can touch it, if you can let yourself be with it just for a moment, it will begin to loosen its grip on you some. And those who were able to do that, to not pull away, but to stay with it, were ones that over time seemed to make the very best progress. You just heard me use a couple of words that, that I've learned from Buddhist teacher Pema Chodron. They are the words to stay with to stay with something. To stay with something touches upon what O'Malley says is the fourth tool, and it is the tool of changing our relationship to discomfort. Instead of resisting at first to be with it, to stay with it. And when Pema Chodron speaks about the idea of staying with it, staying with the discomfort, staying with the pain, she'll often bring it down to a as a simple, relatable um, scenario of what happens to many people physically when they learn to meditate. How many of you have ever decided to expand your meditation time from what you had been doing before? Raise your hand. So maybe you'd been meditating for 10 minutes and you decided you're going to me meditate for 20. Or maybe you decided, I'm going to go to the Healing Light Meditation Service and I'm going to meditate for 45 minutes. And I've never done that before. And I'm going to sit in a, what I think is the, the meditation pose with my fingers like this and my legs crossed. What often happens to us? Come on, what happens? We, we start to feel discomfort. <laughs> when I asked the question at, at first service, somebody said, I start to feel pain. <laughs> and I'm fidgety. And it feels physically, physically off. When Pema talks about, about this, she says to practice staying with the discomfort. Isn't that totally counterintuitive? To stay with it to the place that where when we, to the, the point where as we stay with it and allow it to be, it does in fact begin to loosen its grip on us. This is the way 
the way um, Mary O'Malley writes about it. Changing your relationship to, to discomfort. Rather than resisting discomfort, we go toward it. Whenever our mind, body, or heart feels tight, we're resisting something. Become a tightness detective. What makes you tight is of the fight. The more you awaken from the spells, the more you realize there is nothing worth closing in around. You don't close around, you stay with, you open into. You stay with, you open into. Close with a piece she reads that I think is really important, that she writes that I think is really important. As your attention, which is what happens when we stay with something, we're staying with it by bringing our attention to it rather than our physical energy of resisting. She says, as your attention begins to touch and open up the bound parts of yourself, it can hurt. But this is the hurt of healing. There are many deeply hidden parts that are painful when they come close to the surface within us. But these are the states that need our attention the most. But these are the states that need our attention the most. And here is a description or a metaphor for it. She writes, when you are meeting your deepest holdings, turning toward your experience can be likened to what happens when your hand gets cold on a winter's day, so cold that your fingers turn white from the blood vessels contracting. Nod your head if you know what she's writing about. Some of you are transplant Southern Californians. You know what winters can be like. When you put your fingers then in warm water and the blood begins to flow back in, it hurts like heck. She wrote the other word. At times, that is what it is like when the energy begins to flow again in our body and heart. As your attention touches and opens up the bound up parts of yourself, it can hurt. But this is the hurt of healing. Just as your hand feels alive again after the blood flows back in, you feel much more alive when the bound up parts of you begin to open up again. Healing comes when these bound up parts receive full acceptance and they let go of you. Namaste. Many people enjoy Reverend Wendy's talks and meditations and aren't able to attend the Unity Center in person. If you're part of our extended family from around the world and would like to help support the Unity Center, please go to our website or download our free app, which offers even more ways to connect with the Unity Center. Namaste.